Yoram Chazoni, and this is NatCon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today, I'll be speaking with Patrick Deneen, one of the leading voices in political theory in the United States. He is professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame and author of a brilliant and controversial book, Why Liberalism Failed. Patrick Deneen, welcome to NatCon Talk. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you, Patrick. Uh, we have an awful lot to talk about. We'll be talking about your book and the prospects for uh, the appointment of uh, apparently a devout Catholic to the United States Supreme Court. But before we uh, get into all of those really big issues, I want to start someplace different. It's about 30 years ago that you and I were classmates in, in the Rutgers political theory program. I, I don't think you thought you were going to be a political theorist when you first came to Rutgers. And both of us were uh, deeply, deeply influenced by the education we received there. Uh, Carrie McWilliams was uh, your mentor for, for many years. And I, I, don't, I don't think Carrie saw himself as a conservative, probably quite the opposite. And yet here, here we are 30 years later, and he's had this uh, huge influence through you and a bit through me uh, on political theory in the United States. Can you tell us how did that happen? Sure. It is really quite remarkable that uh, you and I both emerged from the same program at the same time. We didn't actually know each other very well at all. I think we may have only had one class together. Uh, I was actually an undergraduate at Rutgers, and uh, uh, I was an English major, not a political science major. Uh, but uh, I took more or less every class that uh, Kerry McWilliams taught one, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I was pointed in his direction um, when I was a freshman, uh, and I just adored him. Uh, he was really one of the greatest teachers, I think, ever to, to walk the earth, uh, and really just genuinely a deep, profound uh, thinker, but also someone who could really connect with his students. Uh, Carrie suggested, uh, as I made my way through undergraduate studies, that I should go off to the University of Chicago and study with his friend Alan in the Committee on Social Thought. That was Alan Bloom. And I did that. I, um, I, I spent a, a year uh, studying in the Committee on Social Thought and decided uh, as really as remarkable and impressive as that program was that what I really wanted to do was to study with Carrie. So I did in fact return to Rutgers and with, a, with, with every intention of being a, a political theorist. And you know, you're right, Carrie considers himself definitely a man of the left, but an older left. Uh, he was uh, he was an FDR kind of uh, Democrat. Uh, and so when it came to sort of the social issues, uh, he was actually, I think, fairly conservative. Um, but beyond that, I, I would point to the kind of interesting influences in Kerry's own intellectual formation. He was a student of Sheldon Wollins, who was a famous leftist, uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Berkeley free speech movement. Uh, but he also was deeply impressed by and influenced by the thought of Leo Strauss. And he saw himself as this kind of interesting blend of a kind of Wolin Strauss understanding of Western political thought. But I think the thing that really distinguished Carey in that world was that he accepted Strauss's division between the ancients and the moderns. And he identified himself with the ancients and in particular with the, the biblical, the classical and biblical tradition. He was himself a devout uh, Presbyterian. Um, and so he was, he was an unusual figure who's hard to classify on the left and the right. And I, I suppose to some extent I've inherited that, uh, some, something of that quality myself. Well, you became famous, I think, let's say around 2012, with an essay called uh, Unsustainable Liberalism. And then followed up, of course, a couple of years later with uh, your, your spectacular book, Why Liberalism Failed, uh, which has made you uh, famous in some circles, notorious in quite a few others, uh, w but not everybody who's watching us is uh, is familiar with uh, you know the, the scandal that is uh, Patrick Deneen's claim of uh, an unsustainable liberalism. Why, why don't you walk us through the basics of what does this mean? What is liberalism? The way that you're using the term, and what is it that makes it unsustainable? And what's so bad about that? So when I, when I speak of liberalism, and you know, especially if you have an American audience, they might tend to think that what I'm talking about is sort of the left side of the American political spectrum. Uh, what I'm, when I'm speaking about liberalism, I'm really speaking about the philosophical project of liberalism in the coming out of the Enlightenment era. And the names John Locke and John Stuart Mill in the United States, John Dewey, you know, would figure prominently as 
architects of the liberal philosophical worldview. Uh, that, that translates into a political project. And the political project is, again, there are many ways that we could describe this, but one way we, I think we can describe it is that um, liberalism is really, you could say, it's a way of seeing the world in which all of the ways we exist in the world, and it can be through relationships, it can be through politics, it can be through um, uh, uh, memberships that we might have in various groups and associations. All of those have to be to the greatest extent possible the result of our autonomous individual free choice. Uh, and that we have to shape and create a world that liberates us as much as possible from any possible influence upon our, the free exercise of our, autonom our autonomous independent will and choice. And so while it posits that we can be strong members of different communities and different associations and families and so forth, it actually shapes a world that seeks to free us from all of those things. And you could, you could even say begins to become a force for freeing us from those kinds of memberships, traditions, associations, cultures, and so forth. So it becomes a powerful shaping force that claims not to be shaping, that frees us uh, from anything that's shaping. But of course, it actually shapes us. And it's really this paradox at the heart of liberalism that I'm really that I really seek to focus in on, and the and the reason I call it unsustainable is that ultimately uh, it breaks down any capacity and undermines any capacity for us to be shaped as members of communities, whether as members of families, as members of religious communities, as members of uh, neighborhoods and, and and broader geographic communities, and even as members of nations. Uh, that that liberalism ultimately acts as a kind of acid on all of those shaping forces uh, that in many ways are required for us to develop the kinds of characters we need to be virtuous human beings. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that human beings um, by nature, let's say, uh, are, are, are not simply uh, disconnected atoms. We tend to form families and, and uh, tribes, nations, communities, churches, and uh, we do that all the time and everywhere pretty much. Uh, except uh, in those societies where there is a constant pressure to tell people, no, the family's not important. No, the, the church community or the synagogue, the nation, those things are less important. What's important is, as you say, your, your own autonomy. Now, is this a description? I mean, it sounds a little bit, you know, it sounds a little bit at first glance like you're describing kind of Ayn Rand. But... Uh, I, I think that you're actually talking about something much broader. You're talking about uh, a, a broad liberalism that includes uh, thinkers on uh, on the political center left, you know, a John Rawls kind of a worldview, uh, as well as the more libertarian thinkers on, on the center right. Is that right? Really, the settlement that existed in the West, let's say, for at least the last 50 years, certainly after uh, World War II, and certainly broadly the American settlement, uh, was really between two different sides of the same liberal coin. And the debate wasn't over whether or not we were and ought to be a liberal society. It, the debate was over the best means to achieve that. And, and to, you know, to boil it down somewhat simplistically, uh, the people called conservatives argued that the free marketplace, the unfettered marketplace, was the place where we could best and appropriately act as these unfettered individual choosers, the, the sovereign uh, autonomous chooser of the liberal imagination, while somehow sequestering family and civil life uh, from the potentially baleful influences of that philosophic worldview. Whereas the, the, the progressive left viewed the state as the best means of liberating us, especially from the kinds of social and civil institutions that they regarded as the greater threat to our individual liberty. But in point of fact, what really it seemed to me has been happening for the last at least half century was that you would have an oscillation of one of those two parties of liberalism governing for a time, and they would succeed in the liberal part of their agenda so that the notional conservatives would succeed in creating an ever more open free marketplace that expanded, became globalized, uh, free trade agreements became the order of the day, um, but would have very little success in preserving or even shoring up the strength uh, and vitality of family 
of religion, of neighborhood, and so forth. And vice versa, the, the progressives uh, were able to strengthen an increasingly liberal state without in really any effective way being able to restrain uh, the, the more corrosive parts of the, of the market. So really, while we've enacted this uh, almost kabuki dance of uh, oppositional parties in the United States for the last 50 years, what was really winning was liberalism. Uh, and the argument of my book is that over time, liberalism becomes fully itself. And when it becomes fully itself, it succeeds, but it fails. And, and that's really the kernel of the, the argument of my book. Liberalism fails precisely because it succeeds. So if we look at, let's say, the period beginning in the 1960s, I think that's uh, roughly the time that you can point to where where these two liberal political parties, a liberal left and a liberal right, uh, create kind of a two-party hegemonic liberalism, which which declares itself to be, you know, the American worldview, uh, leaving out, you know, a, a more traditional uh, a Burkean conservatives, let's say, on one side, leaving out uh, kind of a, a, a socialist uh, worldview on the other side. And that's lasted, you know, that lasted, I don't know, 50, 60 years, that, that dominion of hegemonic liberalism. Uh, today, it seems like that is uh, under severe fire, uh, not, you know, not only from, uh, not only from nationalists uh, on the right, you know, the kind of Trump, Brexit uh, worldview that is skeptical of this hegemonic liberalism. You know, maybe around 2016, it looked like that would be the main challenge to liberalism. But at this point, uh, after the summer of 2020, we've gotten to see uh, major liberal institutions like the New York Times or, or Princeton University uh, kind of be, be uh, stampeded by uh, young, a young neo-Marxist or updated Marxist kind of a movement that, uh, that wants to overthrow the power structure. And those are certainly not liberals of the kind that you wrote about in, in your book. They, they, they want a revolution. They want uh, the, the liberal power structure to be torn down and replaced by something else. So you didn't get that to that in your book. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you see this, uh, this updated Marxist uh, wannabe revolution uh, as it's storming the liberal strongholds in America? I think you know, on the one hand, that's that's right. That what we're seeing is is a kind of uh, certainly a, a critique of the old centrist liberalism uh, on both the left and the right. But I but I think that that what we're seeing on the right, in particular, in the development of you know, various iterations of a of a post liberal conservative conservatism, is a genuine attempt to craft an alternative to this liberal understanding that uh, that I just laid out. Whereas what seems to me taking place on the left is a kind of intensification of what already existed in liberalism, uh, directed at those institutions and those practices and those cultures and those customs that has always been in the uh, in in the uh, in the target uh, of, of liberalism. So it's a kind of uh, extreme version or variant of a kind of progressive liberalism. And the funny thing is that even it, as it describes itself as socialist, it's actually not very social. Uh, it doesn't actually emphasize the institutions uh, that craft and create sociability, the family, uh, the neighborhood, the religion, the community, and so forth. Uh, it, seems to be, it seems to be as um, fundamentally individualistic and antisocial uh, as uh, as the liberalism from from which it sprung, uh, I've been reading a lot of Augusto Del Noche, um, as you may have seen me tweet about. And Del Noche, who wrote in the 1960s and 70s, I think he discerned that Marxism was really morphing into a kind of intensified version of progressive liberalism, a kind of materialistic hedonism uh, that that abandoned the Marxist vision of the of the kind of utopian, egalitarian, economic uh, sort of flourishing that would take place after the revolution and was really able to wed itself to a kind of capitalism uh, that provided the kinds of hedonistic goods uh, that, uh, that modern human beings increasingly wanted uh, in order to almost to define what happiness was. And it seems to me this, this, this so-called socialism that we're seeing 
uh, is actually very comfortable in, in lots of ways uh, with, um, you know, a kind of woke capitalism worldview. I mean, it's, what's striking is how much the, the big corporations are melding themselves uh, to, uh, to this kind of identity politics driven, uh, highly um, individualistic, uh, norm breaking, uh, uh, anti-traditional worldview. Uh, that seems to me to be really, um, uh, as I said, a kind of intensification rather than a genuine alternative to liberalism. Well, you're a professor at, uh, at Notre Dame, which is uh, a Catholic university. And uh, I, I know that your, uh, that your connection to Catholicism is, uh, is devout. You're a serious Catholic. And it seems to me that this connection to Catholicism must uh, influence your critique of liberalism and your views of what's happening in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Where, do, where, does, Catholic, where does Catholicism fit within sort of the, the economy of Patrick Deneen's soul a little bit and, and then connect to your political theory? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, Yoram, you 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 and you took courses with Kerry McWilliams uh, as well, and uh, a lot of the critiques of liberalism that you know, I, I I have developed and argued for, I really learned uh, you know at the at the foot of of Kerry McWilliams, who himself was not Catholic, although he was very sympathetic and admired Catholicism, its uh, theology, its philosophy, its tradition. Um, so, at, at, on one level. Um, I guess I would describe what appealed to me about Carey's critique is doubtless because of uh, a kind of Catholic formation that wasn't as on the surface uh, at the time I was taking those kinds of courses uh, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. And and like a lot of my, my peers and even members of my family, I might have drifted away from the faith if it hadn't been for a kind of almost an intellectual renaissance with my encounter of a kind of theological artistic tradition in Catholicism that really only took place uh, in the latter parts of graduate school and um, and then into uh, my the early years of my uh, professoriate uh, when I was at Princeton University. So in lots of ways, I think that um, uh, my Catholicism, it, it turned out um, becoming almost in some ways deeper because of my my the critique of liberalism that I had initially been quite attracted to, uh, and uh, my sort of reencounter, what sometimes we call a reversion to the faith, uh, deepened, uh, and I think allowed me to understand better this critique. So this is by way of saying that it seems to me you can you can engage in a kind of analysis of liberalism and come to very similar conclusions without necessarily coming from a, a Catholic background or Catholic position, but I do think that it is a part of Catholicism and a very, a very central part of Catholicism uh, that, that's informed by both the biblical uh, Old Testament, New Testament, as well as the classical Aristotelian tradition that argues that we are by nature political and social animals. In other words, we are by nature creatures that are in some ways bound to one another and that we don't become truly individual selves unless and until we have uh, participated in and been a part of and been shaped by the kinds of sort of shaping institutions, civilizing institutions that we human beings need in order for our nature to emerge. So it's the, it's the exact opposite of what you encounter in the kind of state of nature philosophies uh, of, uh, of, early, of early liberalism that argues that you can look at human beings in their nature and see the fullness of the human person. Uh, rather, uh, we are creatures that become fully human through the kinds of institutions, through the kind of cultural formation uh, that makes our nature fully manifest and fully uh, and, and, and allows it to, 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 to grow to the fullest extent. Uh, so I, I, I think as, as a Catholic and as someone whose tradition um, is, is deeply rooted in that both biblical and Aristotelian understanding of the human person, uh, it's, it seems to me that one has to confront ultimately uh, and, and think through what an alternative uh, to the dominant liberal paradigm of, of, the, uh, of what is assumed to be the human person and all of the kind of consequences that flow from that. Did I uh, notice you, you uh, on social media uh, talking about uh, Burke and Disraeli recently? 
what, do, how, do, how, do, how do they fit into your thinking these days? I, I think in lots of ways. So I'm actually writing a, I'm writing a sort of follow-up book right now, and Burke and Disraeli figure rather prominently uh, in um, this, this. I think you'll, you'll be interested and I hope pleased about this uh, in what I, what I really think has been a conservative tradition that has been largely lost. It may have never really been all that present in the United States, although I do think there are some strands here, uh, but a conservatism that was self-consciously not liberal that was self-consciously in many ways shaped, not merely as a critique of liberalism, but as a genuine alternative to liberalism. And, and really, I think, you know, roots itself in this more kind of Aristotelian understanding of the human person uh, that is uh, in many ways uh, becomes fully human through a kind of inheritance of practices and experience. Uh, and um, customs and traditions that are not that are not simply chosen, nor are they unconsciously um, practiced. Right? We are creatures that interact with our traditions and our customs, and we're always interacting with them. We're not merely thoughtless sort of, you know, uh, uh, herd animals. Uh, we um, uh, we we respond in in energetic and often creative ways. But to think of ourselves as somehow separate or outside of those traditions is to mistake what it is to be a human being. And Burke and Disraeli both writing um, really uh, as you know, the Enlightenment you know, sort of launches its political project and as it, uh, as it, as it uh, develops, especially in England, I think, I think they develop a really rich way of thinking about uh, an alternative way of considering politics, society, uh, the cultural institutions uh, of, of a place like England as that which constitutes the human person. And here's what I think is really critical, is they saw these institutions, these practices, these customs and traditions as deeply and profoundly democratic, if I can put it in that way. In other words, they arose from the demos. They weren't imposed from above. In fact, what they feared and suspected was that the kind of enlightenment vision of freedom had to be imposed from above, often against the wishes of the people uh, who wanted to, to retain those institutions and those practices, which they had, they had inherited and they had contributed to. And so, uh, so in many ways, the enlightenment project was an assault up, upon democracy, upon the kind of genuine democracy uh, that Burke writes about as uh, you know, the kind of social contract between the living and the dead and the not yet born, the genuine democracy of generations. And uh, Burke and then later uh, Disraeli both develop uh, this understanding of what, what Disraeli would describe as Tory democracy. It's a democracy uh, that, that seeks to retain and conserve institutions, cultures, and practices precisely because that's democratic. And I find this to be just a, such a rich uh, and largely forgotten tradition, uh, certainly in the United States today. Uh, although I do, as I said, I do think we have our own versions of this. And in that chapter, I'm talking about some of the arguments uh, of the opponents of the Constitution, the Anti-Federalists, who echo many of these same themes in their concerns about uh, what they feared was a similar kind of effort to impose a kind of top-down system on the American people. So, so what we have to look forward to in the next book is, uh, is a a Tory populism, a, a a populist Burke and a populist Disraeli. Is that right? I mean, I, I think it's it's really it's just trying to recover what is in some ways you could say is genuinely conservative, as opposed to the kind of faux conservatism that we've, you know, that has gone under the name conservatism, but was really a variant of liberalism. Uh, and to understand that this conservatism is actually genuinely the alternative to liberalism. It's not simply a variant within liberalism. Uh, and, and in many ways, yeah, precisely to say that this is, this is a, this conservatism is most genuinely a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of great defense of the demos of the people of ordinary people and i think it explains to a good, great extent why across the world today across the developed world today the demos right what is now vilified uh, among many of our colleagues uh, the populists the pop the people uh, are increasingly moving in a conservative direction precisely because they see a, a profound threat to the institutions and way of life uh, that they deeply and they deeply treasure.
and want to retrain, retain and preserve and see a kind of assault from above uh, upon uh, what they have built and what they have inherited. Patrick, I want to dive into a question that I know I, I know you've uh, gotten it a few times. It's definitely of interest to uh, to our viewers. Uh, in the wake of your book, there's been kind of a recurring theme of people attacking uh, why liberalism failed and accusing you of uh, of wanting to undermine the American founding, of rejecting the American founding as a liberal founding, and in fact. Uh, of seeing the United States as a country that was misfounded, so that it's kind of there's almost this inevitable trajectory from from a a, a misfounded America to where we, we are today. Uh, does that in any way reflect your 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 actual views on the subject? What do you have to say about it? Well, I mean, it's 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 some ways it's partially correct uh, in in the following way that uh, at least it was partially the case that the United States founding, uh, in particular the constitutional founding, what had a healthy dose of Lockean philosophy uh, that flowed into that founding. A number of our, our founders and the kind of fashionable philosophy at the time was really drawing from those enlightenment, at least some of them, uh, some of those currents were from that enlightenment tradition. Uh, and, and, and it's fairly clear, and I try to highlight some of these uh, some of these arguments in the book, it's fairly clear that some of the most, what we regard as some of the most important arguments justifying uh, our constitution are really uh, drawn very, you know, follow very closely uh, arguments that you can find, for example, in John Locke um, at the time, uh, at the time of the founding. Uh, so for example, um, you know, maybe the most famous of the Federalist Papers is Federalist Number 10. Uh, and um, you know, Madison makes a number of arguments in Federalist 10 in which he indicates that the, the, you know, the rationale for not um, seeking to ground the Constitution on what he, re what he, what he calls moral and religious motives, uh, that, that moral and religious motives of the citizenry and of the leadership are simply not reliable uh, guides um, and not reliable presences on which to base the Constitution, uh, but rather really what, what needs to, what really needs to be operative is an idea of sort of contending interests in order to protect the contending interests within the broader society. Uh, the first object of government, Madison writes, is, is, is the protection in the, in the diversity of faculties of men. In other words, to protect our differences is the first object of government. And the way in which our differences become manifest is different attainments of property. Of course, the, 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 the essential and important right of property uh, and with which I, I agree and I, I, I support, nevertheless becomes the first object of government because that's the way in which our differences are manifest. And I say this really departs from certainly again an Aristotelian, in my view, a Thomistic, or even a kind of classical understanding of politics in which the first object of government is to protect the common good, that which we share, and not which that which in some ways divides us. So to the extent that that's a major theme not the only theme, but a major theme at the time of the American founding, that's problematic. But it wasn't, it wasn't in itself necessarily so problematic so long as that strand was in many ways surrounded and limited by a lot of other strands uh, that were present at the time of the American founding. Now, most, most of my critics who, uh, who find my argument um, uh, problematic, uh, in other words, that we have become more Lockean and we have defined the Constitution as more Lockean over time, usually criticize me because they share, they actually share the view that the founding was in fact Lockean and it's a good thing too. They, they actually uh, uh, um, disagree with me that, uh, that, that the founding was wrong uh, precisely because they admire and they want to commend the kind of Lockean enlightenment version of the founding. Now in this sense, they, they uh, diminish, it seems to me, the richness uh, and the manifold strands that, um, that contributed to the founding. You know, our, our, again, to mention um, a common teacher, Carrie McWilliams was fond of pointing out especially the biblical strand uh, that, uh, uh, that contributed to the American founding. And he often called it the alternative voice 
influence in American politics. And any listeners who are interested because of our conversation in Kerry's arguments, he wrote a very long book. The one big book that he wrote was called The Idea of Fraternity in America. And really the purpose of that book was to track and to trace that alternative strand, especially that biblical strand, which he regarded as, um, uh, as uh, um, seeking to undergird and to reinforce the centrality of fraternity. In other words, our relationality, our sociability. Uh, and that this was as vital a strand in the American founding, but as the liberal strand gained more dominance, as it became, uh, uh, as it became predominant in the American mind uh, and in the American self-definition, that fraternal strand became uh, diminished and became a, a sort of a minor chord uh, in the American self-understanding. So Carey's project wasn't just to say America bad, something else good. His, his project, and I say I would share that project, was to say we need to strengthen and indeed uh, to make, to increase the volume uh, of those minor chords and make them really much more major chords in our self-understanding. I, I find the discussion, I mean, the, there's recently been this debate about uh, about whether Americans are committed to the idea that politicians should pursue the common good. Uh, and I, I have to admit that I'm astonished that there could be a debate about whether whether American politics is about the common good. Now, it's it's true that uh, as as you as you call what you call you're calling the liberal strand of the American founding. I mean, certainly uh, thinkers like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson or Paine and uh, and Madison in certain moods uh, can can definitely be correctly read as moving away from a traditional uh, Christian, you could say Jewish or Christian, Jewish and Christian uh, view that politics is about pursuing the common good of, of, of the society. But, you know, that that at the time of the founding was a minority opinion. The, the, the Federalists, Washington, John Jay, John Adams, uh, uh, Hamilton and the, the entire Federalist Party was very much, very much still a a Christian party, and some of the more radicals were also very much Christian, and that's the reason that the preamble of the American Constitution uh, uses these uh, terms like uh, uh, like like uh, the general welfare, uh, uh, establishing justice, uh, the, the common defense, the the use of terms like common and general. Uh, to describe what Americans understand their goals to be, I, I, I think is, is if, if not ubiquitous, I think it's, it's dominant. Now, those thinkers, the, the, those founders are drawing from other thinkers. Many of them did read Burke, but there's also Montesquieu, who's a very conservative thinker. There's uh, uh, Vattel, who's a very conservative thinker. And uh, of course, David Hume's history is a Tory history of England and all of this in addition to the, uh, the, in addition to the biblical heritage, which, which you and Carrie emphasize. I, I, I feel like this is a, uh, a, not a complete misreading, but but a, but a distortion that beginning in the 1960s, uh, American intellectuals wanted to see the American founding as a purely enlightenment project. And that leads us to this point where, you know, today, if you talk about the common good, you cause an explosion. Or if you talk about the biblical foundations of uh, the American Republic, you cause an explosion, and people say, "No, you, you can't say that anymore." the The question is, when when did we reach that point where you can't say it anymore? I I, I think it's very recent. I think it's the the nineteen sixties and on. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I mean, you know, you could you could track American history and look at it as like the the frog being slowly boiled. You're, I mean, you're right that it uh, uh, it's it sort of you know the frog realizes it's being boiled by the late '60s, but it's almost it's almost as if the more centralized we became, and you know, in, in my book, I argue that um, there's a kind of uh, there's a kind of interaction between the becoming more individualistic, uh, liberating oneself from one's places, one's inheritances, one's traditions, and becoming more um, a member of a centralized state. And, and you know, in, my, in my speech that I gave at the National uh, Conservatism Conference uh, uh, last what, year and a half, two years ago, 
how long ago, uh, I really emphasize that um, nationalism by the 19th century really became the, the progressive project because nationalism was seen as the way of disaggregating people from their localities, uh, of, um, of liberating them from the particularity of the states, the towns, the regions, the, 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 the particular places from which they came. Uh, and uh, and so, so there was a way in which the more, the more centralized we became, the more individualistic we became and vice versa, the more individualistic we became, the more centralized the government became. And the more this came to be the play, the fact, the more the, the government, the, the sort of Washington DC became this behemoth. And of course this was occurring throughout the twenties, even in the late 19th century and then in the 1920s with progressivism and then in the 1940s with FDR and then in the 1960s uh, with uh, uh, the Great Society and so on. I mean, it's just been an ongoing process. The more this came to be the case, you could say the more the language of common good fell out of fashion because really what the government became was the umbrella in which we could all pursue our individual interests, right? So the more we became singularly this this idea that we simply were all members of one thing, one overarching entity, right? So in the, I think, I think it was the 2012 uh, um, election, uh, the Obama uh, campaign during the, const during the uh, sorry, the Democratic convention aired a, a, a television ad in which they said, government is the only thing we all belong to. And I really, that really <laughs> stood funny. out to me that that's the only thing that we have in common now. But in a sense, what that was saying was the only thing that we have in common is the thing that makes it possible for us now to have nothing in common, right? It's to, it's to, to mention another ad, it's the life of Julia. Uh, if you remember that television ad, or actually it was a, it was a computer ad, it was a, 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 a set of slides you could watch online. And it portrayed the life of this young woman who because of a series of government programs was able never to have to rely on any other human being uh, had apparently had no family, came from no family, uh, and had no relationships, but had a successful life because of all the programs that President Ob Obama had created. So this is what government was able to do: was create us, create a completely autonomous individual self. So, uh, you know, this frog idea of the frog being boiled. What's interesting is you go from a country that's, you know, with highly various. A lot of different um, religious traditions, a lot of different uh, ways of understanding ourselves in our communities. You know, the regional diversity was was just extraordinary. The, even the linguistic diversity. We had French speakers and German speakers, but um, even aside from that, this, there was a sense that we were all Americans. But we could also pursue the idea of the common good in these various communities in which we were we were participants. But the more we became this singular entities, these individuals whose sole connection was to and through the government and whose individuality was created in a sense, uh, increasingly by the government, the more the language of the common good now became sort of horrific and unmentionable because this sounded like something that we should all become you know, the same, something that should make us into the same. And yet notice what the result of this has been to make us more homogenous flatten to flatten out what it is to be an American now uh, to, to destroy the kind of regional cultural diversity uh, that, that once existed in the United States uh, and, and as a consequence to make the idea of a common good oddly enough now now almost inconceivable to, to uh, certainly the, the chattering class in, the, in America. Well I, I don't think that I know any conservatives uh, who I, I mean literally probably not a single conservative of any stripe uh, who would sign on to you know the the the, the president the, the present administrative state which uh, legislates in place of Congress has millions of employees uh, getting you know getting into virtually every corner of what it is that uh, the way people lead their lives there I, I don't think there are any conservatives who, who who believe in that kind of a state that's a uh, a state that was dreamed up by uh, by Woodrow Wilson to allow experts to govern instead of uh, in, instead of the the people, uh, but the the conservative interest in you know in in centrality has a lot to do uh, with whether whether there is a government that is uh, powerful enough, vigorous enough to be able to uh, deal with threats from outside or 
uh, or, or, or crises inside. I think it's a mistake to see vigorous government, government that believes in the common good and thinks that that's its job, with large government or vast government, government that thinks that its job is to control everything. So l let's take, for example, I was uh, last week, uh, I was speaking with uh, uh, David Goldman on, on this show. And uh, D David is, you know, a, a great believer in, in freedom and in, in, in the free enterprise system and in localism. Uh, that's, that's not a man who's a socialist. But his argument is that the United States government has to face uh, the fact that it's being uh, overtaken by China, that Chinese manufacturing, Chinese advances in technology have created a situation where uh, the, the ultimate existence of the United States and of, of democracies is, is in fact being threatened. And he wants, he proposes that government should be focusing as you know, the Eisenhower administration did and going forward during the beginning of the Cold War, focusing on uh, on uh, funding and encouraging uh, research, research and development of primarily we weapon systems. But that, th those things will have spinoffs in all directions. Now, you don't need to have a, you know, a vast administrative state in order to be able to administer that program. And I don't think that it's uh, it makes sense either to argue that there's a slippery slope that that if you're funding R and D for for the for, for advancing uh, American capacities in in engineering and, and and weapon systems and and basic scientific research that that necessarily means that you're going to have to be socialist and I I think that if we looked at the generation of the the founders you know with the exception of uh, uh, especially of Jefferson. That I think that that would have made sense to them to say there is such a thing as a national project that requires visit, uh, vigorous government, and that's not intended to take away uh, the uh, the commitment to localism, the commitment to diversity and variety. Why can't those two things coexist? Because I think that's what we're being told today over and over again is they can't coexist. You can't have a government that is uh, active. Uh, in 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 helping deal with actual problems, and at the same time, not wipe out the uh, self government of local communities. Yeah, well, you know, it's striking how uh, that you began by saying you 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 think that there's, you know, general if not universal agreement that conservatives are critical of the administrative state, uh, but I think an interesting way that's that's changing uh, and maybe changing fairly quickly in the following sense, and I think it's, it echoes what you were just saying. There, there's certainly, I mean, you can think of someone like Adrian Vermeule maybe most prominently, uh, and, and a lot of the writing that's taking place in the journal American Affairs is is really is really trying to pivot from what was really just a kind of knee-jerk anti-government stance, you know, going back to the 1980s that all government is bad, all government is socialist, to thinking about what is, what are the ways that government is needed, especially today, uh, in a different circumstance, is needed to secure the conditions for the common good, and part of that echoes exactly what you were just saying, which is that there are going to be areas where you're going to need something we might call industrial policy. Uh, you know, something that, you know, Madison, I'm sorry, that Hamilton describes uh, in his essay on the manufacturers, uh, that, that you, in order for, to secure national security, production of certain kinds of uh, goods, certain kinds of uh, not only munitions and armaments, but also things like uh, medicines, pharmaceuticals, uh, that you don't want to leave uh, to be produced overseas, uh, as we've so recently experienced, uh, that you need to have policies in place to ensure that those products are being produced here uh, in ways that, that, that ensure um, uh, you know, a, a, a good supply. But I also think that there's growing interest in the ways that the, the administrative state is needed in part to combat, or at least to um, uh, exist as a kind of countervailing force against some incredibly uh, you know, massive powers, especially in the commercial sphere. Uh, 
and we can think about some of the, the big tech companies, the Amazons, the Googles, the, the, the Microsofts and so forth, uh, that, that it, I think, uh, you know, take Google, for example, and some of the things Senator Hawley has been focusing on, uh, do not always seem to have America's interests really at heart, uh, have, seen, have been seen at times uh, to be fairly uh, fawning in their relationship to China. Uh, and uh, in ways that really raise questions about whether being an American company means anything. So in an age in which uh, uh, our relationship to China is becoming uh, increasingly strained. Uh, and, I, and I also think that um, when we, we talk about the common good in economic terms uh, as well, uh, there's a place for a vigorous state uh, in ensuring um, uh, an economic system in which uh, the economic playing ground is, isn't simply uh, beneficial to the largest, to the most monopolistic players. Again, this was this was a part of the American tradition going back to the founding that that there's a mistrust uh, for concentration of power, whether it's set government power, but also economic power. Right? You read most of the, those figures in the founding area, founding era, and they express as much reservation about concentrated economic power as they do about concentrated state power. And we're at a point now where you may need a certain degree of state power to restrain some of this concentration of economic power, but also to make it more possible for uh, average people to be able to start uh, and, to, and to run successful businesses in their local places. So in this sense, there's no contradiction between, again, as you put it, a vigorous government that has an administrative uh, feature and administrative capacity uh, and strengthening the both the national and more local parts of the nation that are essential for a thriving uh, nation to persist. Now, since you, you mentioned Adrian Vermeule, of, uh, professor of uh, law at Harvard, he's probably at this at this point uh, the the best known of the uh, of the academic spokesman for the position that uh, the American politics should, in fact, be pursuing the common good, that, in fact, every, every nation's policies uh, should be directed towards some kind of common good. But I'm, I'm not sure that a a Adrian is himself su sufficiently mainstream in all of his views to, to be projecting, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the mainstream arg argument for this. Uh, in, in, in particular, uh, I... You know, bit, because of my interest in na in nationalism and national independence, so it, you know it's it's caught my eye that uh, uh, that Adrian is uh, th uh, a strong believer in the idea that na natural law uh, leads you to the view that there there has to be some kind of framework for world government, which is you know something that's very very difficult and prominent problematic from from my perspective. What what do you think? Are you uh, uh, what, what do you think about national independence? Uh, I know many Catholics who've, who've uh, told me, especially if they have, you know, kind of a Polish background or a Hungarian background, that they've they've said, look, his, historically, um, Catholicism is certainly compatible with national independence, what, what, what I call nationalism, the the uh, a world of independent national states. Uh, but Vermeule uh, seems to be saying the opposite. What, what's your view? Well, I, 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 I consider Adrian to be a friend, and I, he's also, uh, uh, he likes to be a provocateur. And so he, he established, often establishes positions uh, at the very margin of uh, perhaps where someone would want to be uh, in uh, making his arguments. Um, but I think it, it, you know, he does that in a way that clarifies uh, uh, exactly uh, what he thinks are the sort of the, the logical uh, kind of um, conclusion of the arguments that he makes. Uh, you know, but that said, I think he is, he is genuinely um, someone who regards, uh, as, as, you, as you just stated, uh, the natural law, since the natural law is universal, uh, since it is true by nature in all places and in all times, therefore there's no, there, there's no sort of theoretical and philosophical reason why there shouldn't just be one government that would govern in accordance with the natural law. But I think this is, uh, you know, it's while this is philosophically um, not not untrue, I think it is politically problematic. Uh, and and my position, I think, I actually share uh, with Thomas Aquinas, 
who in, in many passages in discussing the natural law, talks about the ways in which the natural law, while it is eternal and it is universal, the way in which it will be uh, ultimately legislated and ultimately applied and promulgated will depend a lot on local variety and local circumstance. And this is why, like Aristotle, Aquinas expresses that maybe the, the political virtue par excellence, certainly for statesmen, uh, is prudence. Uh, there's the need for prudential judgment in terms of the application of the natural law. And he, you know, Aquinas goes so far as to say there will be certain situations in which aspects of the natural law won't be, it won't be possible or it won't be uh, advisable uh, to promulgate those parts of the natural law. And he says it may not be possible, for example, to outlaw prostitution in all times and all places. Probably where he lived at the time in Paris uh, was one place where that was seemed unlikely, uh, which is not to say that prostitution is not against the natural law. It is, uh, but that there has to be a recognition, again, prudentially of local uh, and, and particular uh, uh, prudential considerations. And I think this, this in this way, uh, not only is an argument on the basis of governing according to the natural law, which is to govern on, on behalf of the common good, not only is it compatible with more local forms of government, but it seems to me it's ultimately actually essential uh, that uh, uh, once we get to the level of human law and the application of human law, uh, that ultimately has to be in concert with the natural law. Uh, the, the, the sort of demanding particularity uh, uh, that uh, all, all places and all times demand of legislators and, uh, and of statesmen is going to require that there be a multiplicity of forms of governance. And so it's entirely compatible, it seems to me, uh, to, ha to have the, na the nation as, as one of the forms, uh, maybe not the only form, but the nation as uh, maybe uh, the most reasonable and the most workable form uh, that we have come up with that somehow seems to stand uh, to use Pierre Manon's argument, to stand in the mean between the extremes of the of the polis of the city state and and the extreme of the of the empire, so I I, I think uh, even by Adrian's own reliance upon the natural law, there's there's good reason to think that more local forms of governance are essential in 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 governing in accordance with the natural law. Well, since we've gotten to the natural law, I think I think now's a good time to uh, uh, to take up the the current issues that are uh, roiling uh, the United States uh, as of uh, when we're filming this um, uh, this video cast, uh, President Trump looks like he's about to uh, nominate uh, perhaps uh, Amy Coney Barrett, a, uh, a extremely respected jurist, but who is also a, uh, a, a devout Catholic. And uh, arguments that we've been hearing for years are uh, being trotted out and it's about you know it, it it it's likely to become explosive and the accusation as as you very well know is that uh that catholics believe in this nat universal natural law teaching and therefore in some way they are impaired uh from being able to apply the law according to the constitution uh in in the United States, for some reason, um, which which uh, I think we could get into, for some reason, when it comes to uh, Catholics and their natural law view, this drives people crazy. And I'd I'd, I'd like to hear from you. What is? Um, I mean, certainly there have been plenty of uh, leading Catholics in American politics. Uh, from John F. Kennedy, and to, to today we have uh, uh, Biden and Pelosi, who are Catholics. But I think that there is a perception that those were Catholics who didn't take their Catholicism seriously enough for it to affect the way that they lead uh, the American state. That maybe Catholicism, is, Catholicism was kind of private for them, whereas. Amy Coney Barrett, when she speaks about, you know, her uh, the, about bringing God's kingdom into the world, she sounds to me like an Orthodox Jew, you know, w w saying, our role in this world is to uh, is to advance our understanding of uh, uh, the right and the good and and the true on the basis of our heritage. What do you think? Well, I'm I'm not entirely impartial in this. Uh, Amy uh, 
is a neighbor of mine. She lives across the street. So we have a phalanx of reporters parked outside our, uh, of our house <laughs> on the street uh, at this very moment. Uh, uh, so it's it's been uh, very, very close to home, literally. Uh, and I, I pray for Amy and her family, who are wonderful, wonderful people. And I know, uh, based on past experience, they're likely to be dragged through the mud uh, if indeed she's nominated. It's already occurring. Um, uh, it is, it, it's, it, it's simply the case that America, uh, in more or less its entire history, has been a fairly anti-Catholic country. Uh, in it was founded by uh, by people who uh, you know, were largely in opposition to Catholicism, different sects of Protestantism, uh, and uh, you know to the extent that there was this Lockean strand. I mean, Locke himself said, you know, all religions should be tolerated except Catholicism. Uh, and uh, uh, even uh, when you know someone like John F. Kennedy was elected, he had to promise that his Catholicism would have no bearing on the choices and decisions he would make uh, as president. And this was a promise that no Protestant had to make uh, prior to, uh, you know, and, and hasn't had to make sense. So there is a way in which America has always in some ways had an established religion. Uh, and it is a kind of Protestantism, whether it was a kind of older Protestantism or now a kind of secularized Protestantism, which you know has become a kind of radicalized liberalism. Uh, that it is the case the Catholics have always been fairly suspect, and and they're suspect for the reasons that I was talking about earlier, uh, the, the the ways in which uh, you know Catholics hold that uh, we believe that human beings are by nature social and political animals, uh, that uh, uh, that there is a natural law uh, that uh, supersedes human law. I mean, you know, again, in, in American history, figures have appealed to that natural law, such as Martin Luther King in his letter to the Birmingham jail. But it's a, it's a subject uh, that's obviously, uh, at, to some degree, it, it lies in tension uh, with the, the American broadly liberal, broadly Protestant settlement. You know, and, and even Amy, when Amy uh, was, um, uh, uh, when the hearings were held, uh, when she was uh, nominated for her current position as judge on the Seventh Circuit, uh, Amy had to make clear that uh, when she would render decisions, uh, when she would render judicial decisions, they would be informed by her understanding of the Constitution, uh, her understanding of the law, and that she would not uh, seek uh, to uh, appeal to some understanding outside of the Constitution and beyond, uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the, the written law. I think where we are likely to have, um, you know, if Amy herself doesn't make these debates, I think where you're going to see a growing number of debates, we already see these, is the extent, these are already conversations that we've been having even here, is the extent to which the Constitution itself is a kind of reflection, certainly in some of its forms, a reflection of the, the natural law, that, it, that it's, it itself is undergirded by uh, an older tradition of the natural law. And you, you name some of those in the preamble to the Constitution, uh, the, the appeal to justice, uh, the appeal to um, the general welfare. Uh, that in, in all of these various articulations and, and you know, broadly the appeal to a common good, you know, the, the idea of a common good is what? It is that there is a good. It's not in a good that we merely choose today because 51% of the population thinks it's good. There is a good, there is an objective good. And that objective good is one that we as a people that agree to govern ourselves together uh, and orient ourselves toward that the government has a positive duty to seek uh, to um, promulgate, uh, to support, uh, and where necessary to enforce that good. So the Constitution isn't, uh, as I think it has been increasingly interpreted, merely a non-aggression pact for people to do as they wish. I think the Constitution actually does have a, deep, a deeper foundation in the natural law and so I, while I don't think Amy is going to stress this in her confirmation hearings if she's nominated, I do think that as part of thinking about jurisprudence and broadly what it is to be a legislator, what it is to be a statesman, what it is to be a citizen in the United States, I think we, we're going to have to become, and I hope we will become, much more explicit about the ways that America is a project, a political project, to secure the common good and not merely a non-aggression pact of a lot of Hobbesian individuals who simply would otherwise want to destroy each other. So we got to see this summer, I mean, it, 
it's sort of painful to bring bring up this issue, but we got to see a recent uh, a Supreme Court justice uh, appointed uh, Neil, Neil Gorsuch um, in in the Bostock case uh, produce what I thought, having after reading his opinion, I thought it was one of the most tortured uh, feats of reasoning that I've ever seen a uh, a, a judge apply in order to. Uh, twist the law into uh, some kind of uh, conclusion that he 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 believed it had had to come to, even though the the, the letter of the law didn't support his uh, his views. Um, it it's painful to see this kind of thing, and one would hope that no justices, regardless of what side they're on, would resort to that that kind of uh, twisting of the law. But now I'm asking you, with regard to you know, if if, uh, if if not Amy, then uh, someone else. Is it, do you think, possible? And this is, you know, I know it's a complicated question, but if you've got a simple answer, let's have, let's have a simple answer. Is it possible for a believing Catholic uh, who is well-versed in the natural law to sit on the United States Supreme Court and to defend the actual Constitution of the United States without having to find uh, some kind of uh, crisis of conflict between the American Constitution and their Catholicism? Is it possible? I guess, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier, uh, the Constitution uh, is, you know, was a document and remains a document uh, that I think is, uh, was and is grounded in a conception, a much, a much older and deeper conception of the natural law, right? It was certainly a strand in the founding of the United States. This would not have been a strand that was unfamiliar to our founding fathers by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, now, I think what, what's fair to be said is that the, the Constitution, in, its, in, what, uh, in the way in which it was understood, certainly by those who who uh, ratified it uh, was that the the kind of you could say the morals clauses we might say some of the 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 areas of the law that today of course are the most controversial uh, and uh, which often will uh, you could say that the natural law touches very forcefully on so questions of you know, sexual identity um, abortion um, marriage and so forth that the Constitution was was written in many ways, understanding that those uh, those part of the uh, of the political those part of the the part of the political order that would be most responsible for securing those institutions and those practices and those laws would reside in the states. Uh, that there was a a strong sense that the states were the were the loci were the were, were the locations where uh, the the sort of morals and police powers would exist, and that the federal government largely uh, was to exist as a kind of uh, as, as a um, institution to coordinate, especially in times of exigency, uh, obviously to to set up a national economic system. Uh, but in some of the areas that are most controversial today, that there would be a high degree of deference uh, to the states. Uh, I, 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 one of the things that I do wonder is whether, uh, going back to something I said earlier, is whether one way we might best affect and follow the natural law today, from where we are right now, recognizing the need for prudence, would be to allow a far greater ability uh, and freedom uh, for the states themselves to reassume many of, the, of those police and morals powers. Now, this would mean you'd have a patchwork of morals legislation, California would be very different uh, from Georgia and so forth. Uh, but maybe among other things, this could take down the temperature of the United States by several dozen degrees, in which now today, as we're seeing, when you have a Supreme Court uh, uh, vacancy uh, or when you have a national election, what everyone understands is that everything, all decisions now rest on the outcome of that election or on 
uh, who will be appointed to those, uh, to, 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 those, to those empty seats on the Supreme Court. And it seems to me that as a political system, we in a, in a nation as divided, as different, as diverse as the one that we have, uh, we cannot function. Uh, we certainly cannot persist as a nation uh, unless we take some of the temperature out of the room uh, by, it seems to me, reorienting the Constitution in the way it was in many ways orig originally written. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised. Amy's, Amy's known for being a person interested in federalism, uh, uh, among other things. And it wouldn't surprise me if she ended up being a jurist uh, that thought the Supreme Court ought not to necessarily answer all these questions, but allow for a degree of diversity within America uh, to settle those questions on more local levels. Well, we know why American federalism uh, kind of petered out. I mean, you know, pe people still talk about it as though uh, as though America is a is a fed federated republic, but it it isn't really true. And every every issue that is uh, seems to be of decisive importance uh, does end up. Uh, in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has this tendency to make decisions for everyone and to ignore the possibility of federalism. We, now, we know how we got here. It's because of the fact that uh, that the states continued to main slave, maintain slavery. And then e even after maintaining slavery, they continued to, to maintain all sorts of uh, other legal provisions, uh, institutions for uh, for op oppressing blacks and de denying them the possibility of a decent life uh, in in uh, in in many of the states in the United States, so I think that most conservatives that I know today uh, are are sympathetic to the 1960s agenda at least to that extent that they that they're happy that uh, that the federal government interfe intervened in order to. Uh, try to put an end to uh, that kind of uh, uh, oppression of blacks in the South, let's say. The problem is that uh, rather than uh, taking on one particularly horrible um, uh, instance in which uh, m maybe federal interference was, was justified, uh, the result was uh, sweeping, you know, as, as Christopher Caldwell uh, writes in, in, in his new book, um, a uh, sort of the imposition of a sweeping new uh, liberal constitution, uh, which covered uh, not only the issues that you know that that the black minority was suffering from, but but an infinity, an entire you know world of additional uh, additional issues. I think that uh, you're right that a country as diverse as the United States has to be able to. Um, to delegate serious issues down to the to the state level and the, the local levels. Without that, it's very difficult to see how America is going to continue. The question is whether there is enough support in the United States anymore for for something like that. In other words, are uh, the the liberals of all kinds uh, willing to allow there to be conservative states in the United States? I mean, really conservative states is. It, is that is that conceivable? What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it seems to me either either that's what is settled, or there's some kind of a crack up. I mean, uh, it, it seems to me that the it, it's either or at this point. Uh, it, it, you know, yeah, I th I think you know. Of course, you're you're absolutely right, and it is, you know, truly one of the you know un unspeakable. Um, tragedies, that word doesn't even do justice, uh, of, of, of American history. A nation otherwise, uh, in many ways, uh, founded uh, and oriented in very admirable directions toward, toward uh, uh, you know, a new way of conceiving uh, of, um, you know, how, how people could govern themselves, you know, the, uh, the, the first of the modern republics in many ways, uh, but that it was founded also simultaneous to that as a nation that held uh, human beings in bondage. Uh, and we have, uh, we remain uh, stained uh, and deeply, deeply scarred uh, by this issue. It has never been, never been resolved. And I see it as an ongoing tragedy in the following sense that um, I think because there was broadly, uh, you could say almost close to being universally uh, a 
belief, right, something that Caldwell describes, a shared belief that outside of some pockets in the United States that Jim Crow and the legacy of slavery, especially in some of the southern states, was a profound injustice, precisely because it had such moral authority as, as, the, as we went through the 1960s, that many causes that do not, did not, and, and cannot share the same level of moral authority attach themselves to that issue, attach themselves to the issue of how to eradicate the legacy and stain of racism uh, of chattel slavery in the, uh, uh, of the United States to the point where now we have a decision like Bostick, uh, which you know appeals directly uh, to the Civil Rights Act of the of the 1960s, uh, in order to say that there is no such thing as a man and a woman, uh, uh, and in many ways I think one of the great tragedies is that because the issues that increasingly are attached to uh, this profound American sin. Uh, do not do not have the same moral authority. It actually is now undermining a, a genuine capacity once again to come together in America, and to and to genuinely agree to resolve perhaps finally or perhaps at least in a, an additional step of progress to resolve the, the the ongoing issue of racial inequality of America. I, I think that there would be widespread agreement uh, on the need to continue to redress racism in America. But now, especially with things like critical race theory, intersectionality, you have a whole panoply of issues and grievances attached now uh, to the issue of racism that people of goodwill will not sign on to. Conservatives certainly will not sign on to. I think there's no difficulty for a conservative to sign on to an agenda that says we must eradicate every last trace of racism. But they won't sign on to it so long as signing on to it means you have to agree that there is no such thing as a man and a woman. And so I think in many ways, uh, what we see now today as the root cause that's destroyed federalism at some level uh, is also a root cause that's preventing us from really addressing racism uh, as a unified country, uh, as we I think we were on the cusp of being able to do several decades ago. Patrick, looking in America, 2020, very, very difficult summer. Um, possibly opening up to uh, a very difficult fall. Um, is there anything that gives you hope that you can share with us? Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I fear for my country in a way that uh, doubtless like many of my fellow countrymen that I never have before. Um, but I, I suppose... Um, no matter the outcome of this, elec of this election, and I think the election is likely, no matter the outcome, uh, like, it's likely to be both messy uh, and will continue to be, uh, will continue to manifest itself as a divided country. I think we're seeing the emergence of a kind of genuine, I, I don't know whether to call it post-liberal or something different than the liberal settlement of the last 50 to 75 years. And while many people see this as lamentable, as something uh, to be uh, as something uh, to be decried, I think I think it actually portends something genuinely good, which is that if there is to be some kind of a revival of this American project, and I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, uh, it will it will have to be in the form of at least one of the parties. Um, and a significant portion of the American populace dedicating, its, dedicating itself anew to the formation of human beings in exactly the kinds of settings, organizations, memberships, and institutions that we began by talking about. If we look across um, you know, the, 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 the vastness of the country today, what we see is increasingly two Americas, an America that's doing very well, typically in the, on the coast, in the urban areas, uh, in, the, in the financial capitals and so forth, uh, that by all social measures are thriving. And we see an America, uh, especially in the heartland in the South, uh, that's foundering. Uh, people that are not able to form families, people that are, uh, when they do have children, are often out of wedlock, uh, that are addicted to, to various drugs or alcohol. Uh, in, in other words, by every measure, uh, are not flourishing as human beings. And it seems to me that there's a deep and profound responsibility of those who are thriving uh, to begin 
to pay attention to and to care and have concern for those who are not doing well. I think this is one of the great faults of what we might call the elites in our society today. I'm one of them. I teach at one of the more elite institutions. And yet I, and you know, what I see on a daily basis is nothing but disdain and contempt for these people uh, who are often blamed for their own circumstance. Uh, I think if we're going to make ourselves into one nation, it will have to be by at least one part of our political spectrum demanding that everyone has the right and indeed the privilege and, and that there is a widespread duty for human flourishing to be widely available, no matter one's education, one's, uh, one's uh, profession, where one lives. And that this is something that every, every American should be able to share. Uh, and I, and I, I do think that we're seeing the emergence uh, of, a, of something of a political movement to make this, to bring this onto our national agenda. So whether that succeeds, I, at least it seems to me it's there in incipient form. And that at least gives me a little bit of hope for a possible reemergence of, of the great American Republic. Patrick Deneen, thank you for joining us on NatCon Talk. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.